Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining me to check out a little bit about the planets. I'm calling this Alphabet of the Planets, um, and I plan to share a few different angles to what makes each of those characters in astrology, who and what they are, how they work. Um, and then I'm also going to go into a little bit of the yin yang mask fem nature of them in preparation for an event I'm doing both online and in person um, at the end of this month on June 30th, that Friday evening. Um, you can join us to talk about how those configurations, when they're mixed in with the signs, which I'll have another video to talk about, um, how those show up in individual combinations. So, anyway, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and show y'all what I have worked on for. The planets. All right, so this is the alphabet of the planets. So if we think about the planets, kind of like letters in the alphabet, each one is kind of a compact system of information together, and it stands for many different things at the same time. Um, so learning what those symbols mean, uh, representing where the planets are and their archetype, is essential for understanding how they're working together in different combinations. So the first thing I'm sharing is uh, the planets and the cycles. Um, and I'm doing this primarily to show the speed at which a planet moves and how long it spins in any given sign. And so you can see here that the fastest thing in the sky is the moon. The moon is 28 days to get all the way around the zodiac, um, spending about two and a half days in a sign. Um, and so since it is the fastest, it's one of the most personal features in a chart. The moon has the most to say about us on the inside, who we really are within. Um, and then the sun being one of the next fastest, taking a year to go all the way around, 30 days in a sign. Uh, it's kind of why we have our signs built into 12 sections. Um, that is our identity. That's also a quick point in the chart that shows who we are and how we shine and what we want to express on the outside. Um, Mercury then is 88 days. It spends 14 to 30 days in a sign. And so it kind of wobbles and stays close by the sun. That's why it retrogrades um, as often as it does. It's one of the most frequent retrograders. Um, so it'll go, it's always staying close by the sun. So it's a quick planet. Uh, the next quickest Venus is around 23 days to around two months in a sign. And again, that's because she stays fairly close to the sun's position. Um, in astrological terms. So she's always a, just, you know, two, two, maybe I think two or three signs max away from the sun at any given time, um, retrograding back and forth and, and staying in that same zone. Uh, and then Mars stretches it out a little bit further, spending about one and a half months in a sign and spending almost two years to make its round. Um, and it also does retrograde, but it stays a little more prolonged and it uh, takes a little bit, you know, comes back around and, um, matches the time of the sun in a similar way that puts all of these first planets that are not underlined in a category together where there are personal planets. Um, that'll come back later too. Jupiter then takes about a year in a sign, 12 years slower. Saturn, about 30 years to make around two and a half in a sign. Uranus, um, then over doubling that at seven years. Then Neptune, again, about doubling that. Um, and then Pluto, not quite, but kind of doubling that as well. So um, you see it gets slower throughout. And the slower the planet is, the longer it is in a sign, the more of a base note it is in consciousness. It's more of a collective tone. Whereas these quicker things that, you know, with a birth chart are going to change a lot quicker are a lot more telling of our personal and individual nature because they, they change more frequently. So those are the cycles that each of the planets go through. Um, some distinctions about these planets. Uh, these are some things that they each stand for and represent. If we thought of them all like symbols, the, these are what those symbols express. So the sun is our outer expression. And I'm using the symbols here, and so I'll, I'll keep referring to what they are so that maybe they'll get uh, learned along the way. But this little circle is the sun, and that is our outer expression. It's how we want to shine and radiate. Um, it's our creativity. It's how its vital juices are creating things. Um, our sense of identity that we express and put out there and show off our presentation, our display. Um, so it's like the big flashlight in the sky. It shines a light on whatever um, and shows and enlivens and expresses. The moon then is our inner needs and security. Um, it's us on the inside, what we uh, need in order to feel comfortable, to feel fed and secure. 
Um, it's that nurturing impulse to kind of quiet, calm, soothe ourselves and others. It's that home nest environment that that has all those secure, comfortable features. It's the family. It's the people that we're at home with, metaphorically um, and literally. Um, it's that sense of privacy, that inner sanctuary of our um, inner self, our inner emotional habits, rhythms, patterns, etc. Uh, Mercury, then this little figure. Mercury zip zaps around with our communication, its messages, its our words, its written text, its anything that is translating and conveying and moving information around. It's the mind. It's how we think. It's how we make connections. It's how we analyze, flip things back and forth, look at each side of it. It's the idea of all of this stuff, this information and physical matter traveling again. Um, it's logic. It's how things calculate, add up, you know, put together, um, and that quality of movement. So it is that movement apparatus. Um, and as it's representative of the mind and staying so close to the sun at all times, um, it's the messenger of the sun and the mind, the same way that the mind is like the projective element of our self, of our identity out in the world. We run it around to think about things and gather information. Um, and the moon is how we're kind of digesting and um, doing all of that. But uh, Venus then, Venus is a symbol that's going to tell us all about our pleasure, things that feel pleasant and, and just feel good. It's the sense of ease, um, social things, anything that involves others in a harmonious way, um, partnerships. It's going to represent those who we are social or partner ourselves with. We see as other in a beautiful way. It's the idea of beauty, grace, symmetry. Um, things that flow together in that sense of harmony that's um, reciprocal, cooperative, um, all of those qualities. Mars is a symbol uh, that features our desire. It's that like burning instinct we have to go do. What do we you know, viscerally want? So it's that desire to take action, um, contrasting to the other fireball in the sky, the sun, which is how we want to shine and be seen, which is also fire. Um, this is taking action, that thrust of action and, and, and forward momentum. It's what we have a burning passion about, something that really enlivens us and, and sets us off. So it also comes with the fervor, that sense of heat and determination and just, you know, stamina with it. Um, that also has qualities of competition, like in a, like in a competition where you have someone you're, you're competing against or fighting against or trying to win against. Um, and that can also lead to the idea of like a combatant, um, someone that we are fighting against. So it's those that are, you know, on our team or that we're against, but it's all that bigger and energy thrust into a forward drive that's passion. Uh, Jupiter is, Jupiter is this sense of fortune and fortune can mean both, you know, like riches as well as luck. This fortunate quality comes through with Jupiter. Um, it's also very expansive. It's having a large time, large, long-range thinking. Um, it's an abundance of whatever it's um, associated with. It's the idea of exploring, so like stretching the limits and boundaries. Um, opportunity, far-off opportunity, big opportunity. So this idea of just ample abundance, kind of like the cornucopia feature. Saturn then is um, a flip in the sense of it is the structure, the rigid sense of how things are built, put together with discipline. Uh, things like fortitude and integrity are represented in this. It's a very kind of um, solidifying, crystallizing force that is our authority figures, the rules and the limitations um, that we have to work within or work towards. Um, when it comes to the sense of mastery, building something that's really sturdy, worthwhile, standing the test of time, enduring. So all of those kind of condensing, contracting qualities. Um, Uranus or Uranus, we have the sense of freedom, liberation, things that are new, awakened, progressive, liberal, um, things that are weird, anything wacky, unusual, offbeat, and things that are sudden, quick, spontaneous, mutating. Um, all of those features are part of Uranus. Neptune then is going to bring in our qualities like glamour, where you know the glitz and the beauty of the ideal. 
the surrender, surrender to the unknown, the mystery. It's this relaxing kind of melting. Um, it can bring in illusion, the rose-colored glasses, the being starstruck, um, fantasy, things seeming or being, you know, projected better than they actually are or worse than they actually are. Um, it's the also the idea of spirit, spirituality and spirit and um, otherworldliness and the idea of the mystery behind the unseen levels of physical life um, and compassion, the sense of um, all being at one and having compassion for the things that we don't understand and can't control um, that are just part of that life experience, all kind of blur into the theme of Neptune. And then Pluto, Pluto is all about a sense of intensity. Um, it is extremes. It's things getting down to, you know, the darkest point, the hardest point, the, the brightest points, all of the extremes of intensity um, that often lead to and be or are on the precipice of some sort of destruction. It's like taking things to the edge and then burning everything up. It's a transformation. Um, it's often associated with death and rebirth and this idea of like something that's just pulled to the extreme and then it changes suddenly. Um, and it's also about how we wield power and the obsessions related to power, the psychological forces and motivations about power. It's all of that intensity of a very psychological karmic uh, nature wrapped up in that Pluto symbol and distinction. So another view again of our main characters here in the planets. Moving forward a little, and I probably have already touched on some of these words, but I try to think of each of the planets as a verb. Um, and in that sense, um, these are the different activities or the things that those planets are going to do. Uh, the sun being that spotlight is going to illuminate things. It's going to shine a light on it. It's going to put it in the spotlight to be seen. It's going to shine, radiate, show, express, create, enliven, all of those. Um, the moon, this element that keeps coming around so fast, kind of keeps things in a safe, comfortable shell shield bubble of our personality. And so it has this quality of what it constantly is holding, molding. It is like our personal astral molding um, that incubates kind of and hatches who we are, our special quality, what makes us unique later in the, like, as the progression goes. But it's a holding, incubating type of energy um, that also shapes our reactions, which are more unconscious, um, and then our responses. It's our response style, how we respond to different things, how we uh, and how we react when we're, you know, rattled. Um, and so it's also about cycles. It's constantly changing and moving. And again, it's almost like a pottery wheel of like holding and molding the, the personality. So it has a lot to say about our habits, how we habituate things, how we ordinary or regulate things um, and how we nurture ourselves, how we make sure everything feels comfy, cozy, safe, and tasty. Um, and so that's all part of the, the moon's modus operandi also. Um, Mercury. Mercury, again, is all about how we move, how we think, how we speak, getting information from one place to another, how we calculate, add it up, divide it, multiply, subtract, all of that good stuff. It's the mental capacity, um, making connections between different thoughts, being able to separate elements and sort different thoughts, analyzing, dissecting, all of those qualities, those sharp qualities are all part of Mercury. Venus, I've always said, is the magnet of the planets. This is what will pull that which is desirable, that which is beautiful, pretty, valuable. It will pull and it will try to entice and attract um, from that angle. It beautifies things. It softens them. It smoothens them. It harmonizes them. Um, and there's a love quality. It's what we love. So we bring it in. We attract it and pull it together and bring it into harmony with itself so that it all flows in a smooth way. It's inviting. It relates. It complements both in like, oh, your hair looks good. And like, hey, I complete you. It complements other energies, completing them. Um, and it's all about the accumulating value of, of, of having, you know, complementary value. It values things. It evaluates things. Um, so it's that kind of valuing, pulling in that which is pleasant quality is what Venus does as a verb. 
Mars then is the thrusters. It's how we charge off. It's how we push ourselves into things. It's how we energize it. We heat it up. We, we you know, inflame it sometimes. Um, we heat it. We, um, it's how we combat things. It's how we're gonna, you know, come at things as a, a fighter through our ego. We're gonna assert ourselves, or we're gonna compete. We're gonna show how rough and tough and strong and fierce and fat all of that that we are. Um, and it's also how we camaradify. Um, a word I think I made up. Um, but that is the sense of how we uh, bring somebody like into a sense of being a teammate or the sense of, yes, we have a same, we're going the same direction. We're fighting for the same cause. We're devoted to the same thing. Um, and so it has that quality or, you know, like, hey, you're fighting against me. You have an, so it has both of the team teammate camaraderie factor and the competition combatant fighting factor. Um, but it charges things up. Jupiter then is going to, expand it grows it makes things bigger it explores it kind of reaches out it accepts as it enlarges it kind of uh, you know it kind of absorbs everything that it stretches toward and it accepts and it allows that which is larger than itself it gets further and further and includes more inclusively that which it stretches into it's all coagulating together and since it forgives anything that's different, it finds something that's the same. It forgives that which it finds foreign, um, that foreign forgive. Um, it loosens, it kind of gives things some breathing room. It loosens things and includes more. And so it gets bigger. And all of those stretching qualities are the verb of Jupiter. Uh, Saturn then, Saturn is the rough, tough, hard, uh, hard and cold one uh, that will contract shrinking limit the boundary this is the line you cannot cross it it fortifies it hardens it concentrates our thinking it slows things down it hardens materializing manifesting um crystallizing all of those types of qualities are saturn it hardened restrict you know restrictions if you have a diet with a restriction it's for you know it can have a purpose so it's limiting and holding back and boundary putting boundaries on things for a purpose uh, or tightening up, it's tightening things so for a sense of graduating, advancing, slow accomplishment and attainment. So it gets harder and more serious and more physical and more manifest in order for things to make an advance, to graduate to the next level, to uh, make an accomplishment, to, you know, all of those types of qualities. So there's that hardening, realizing quality. Uranus, it's lightning in a bottle. It's that genie uh, quality. It's exciting. It's new. It, it excites things like shocking it. It's a, it's, um, it's electricity. It innovates. It's new, flash, bam, 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 ideas, lightning, uh, light bulbs turning on. It also is like a blown fuse. It's a disruption. It's a zap, zolt. Um, it will rebel. It'll, it's where something does the opposite of what you think goes against something. So it will rebel against something, turn it around, reverse it. Um, it will also level up, level down, level up. So it can elevate things. We're also having some shocking reversals along the way. Um, and there's a sense that it individualizes things. And I really should have added something that speaks to the paradox of how it also collectivizes things. There's this quality with Uranus that kind of zaps things into something very unique, unique and one of a kind and unusual, but also very collectively um, allowing and breakthrough and revolutionary. And so it's just this shocking, electric, stimulating quality of, of as a verb. Um, Neptune, the dream king, is going to be very soft and it's going to be very like, you know, the ocean and music and it dissolves things. It melts the boundary. It kind of, it, it melts things. Um, it merges everything together as one state of oneness. Um, and through that, we, we idealize that everything is one and the same, and we see the best and the worst and the, all of these kind of dreamy qualities. That, so it's a dreamscape of where there's a lot of transcendental qualities, things blurring, things confusing, um, very spiritualized, um, but also very um, ethereal, very hard to grasp, 
Um, it's how we we dream and we envision the feelings and the devotion and the ideals that we um, imagine, but it can also delude ourselves and others um, through a sense of fantasy or grasping like a carrot on a stick that continually will dissolve like a mirage. So there's this dreamy, spiritually melting quality that kind of forgives and let go and washes things um, with Neptune, putting them all together at one, a sense of atonement, a beautiful sorrow um, that kind of stimulates the uh, the emotional fantasy and dream and aim of things. Um, and then the last character, as far as its um, verb quality, we have Pluto, and Pluto is it's going to exacerbate something and intensify it. It's going to obsessify it. It makes you more like a moth to a flame to it, a uh, very extremely kind of pulled, very ooh, like a strong karmic vacuum. Uh, that kind of obsesses something related to patterns, psychological desires, unconscious motives, things like that. It will subsume us. It's where something comes up, you know, it's like the rug being pulled out from under us, um, but in a way that just consumes us from the bottom, from some unknown hidden place. It's just this consumption, like consumed by fire, but from within, from under. Um, that can have a destructive feature. It destroys things. It changes them. It transforms them no matter what. So they rebirth. So those three words, destroy, transform, rebirth, are all part of this fiery, obsessive process um, that's ultimately linked to evolution. It's about how we evolve. It's a slow churn of necessity evolving us through these intensifications or like being drawn to uh, karmic completions in a very um, intense way to kind of make the most drastic um, extreme changes. So those are the verb activities for our planets as we're getting to learn about and know our characters. Um, some other symbols and significations. What are some things they stand for? A little bit shorter here. Um, the sun, wherever we see it, it's going to talk about and be a little a uh, coin, if you will, devoted to our health, our vitality, our joy, our expression. It's just who we are, our central self. Um, the moon is going to be all about our feelings and our home, us on the inside, how we feel about it, you know, what's going on on the inside of us. Um, Mercury, Mercury is going to tune us into travel things, things related to vehicles, cars, things related to communication and messages, learning. Um, I also could, uh, well, I've got people later that will come back up. Um, Venus, Venus is all about money. She's the money girl, um, and others because that which we value, we accumulate and spend our money on and, um, that which we value, we relate to and we enjoy through others. So it's our pleasures, it's our enjoyments, um, relating both to money and an inner self and then how we externalize that with our relationships. Mars, all about our passion, our confrontations, our activity, and our desire. If you're staying active and doing, and Mars has got a real positive quality of, of, you know, things that are, you know, charged up, but the more that it is blocked or frustrated, or it can also lead to confrontation energy. Jupiter, usually always a pretty light fella. Luck, um, opportunity, exploration, meaning, all, all of those qualities are Jupiter. Saturn is going to be things that are disciplining us. It's the hard work. It's where things seem very serious, very heavy, um, serious and severe. And then I put weight with both spellings because it's the idea of something being very heavy and having to have patience and wait an extended time for something. It's long periods of time, heavy weights, those types of qualities that really weigh things down. Uranus will uh, signify surprises, things you didn't have in your plan, things that are just exciting or new, um, and sudden changes when things just the unexpected is really what Uranus is going to symbolize. Neptune is all again about fantasy, illusion, our spirituality, compassion, idealism, all of those dreamy qualities. Neptune is just very dreamy, musical. Uh, poetic, um, um, all of those, unconditionally, you know, boundless. Um, so that is what Neptune will do. And then we also have Pluto, which is going to be senses of power, again, intense sense of drive, hidden drive, hidden power. It often ties in with sex, sex and this karmic intensity 
Um, and those connections and karmas often, I mean, the psychological forces, we could do a whole thing just on um, the sexual aspect. Sex, hidden resources, that which is kind of unseen, unknown, dwelling up from within. Um, and this idea of obsession and death, it's got a survivalism quality. Um, but again, it's all of these like deep, uh, deep, dark, hidden obsession, taboo, all of those reservoirs of our psyche are built up with Pluto. All right, people. So when we look at the different planets, who they would be when they indicate people and figures in our life, either that we're often in uh, situations with or that are uh, showing up more through transits. Um, the sun going around the wheel is going to be talking about um, a reference point for our father. You can see a lot about the father through the sun. Um, it's also the child and son, S-O-N. So there's, you know, the father and the son are one in the sense of being uh, indicated through the solar sun. Um, and it's also just any famous or central figures. And the, the sun is going to show up showing someone that's like the, the center of the group, the center of attention, the spokesperson, the manager, the boss, the standout, uh, the famous person. Uh, moon will always signify mother. It is super related to that archetype. So it's also that. We could also see young children. Um, both the sun and the moon can deal with children, but we would think, you know, the sun is kind of like the... Uh, the little emperor or the golden child. Um, the moon is usually more about babies, younger children, and perhaps daughters more so, um, with it having a feminine quality over the sun's masculine quality. Moon can also be any family figures, and it is a general indicator of things relating to the public at large, the masses, the big, squishy, melting pot of everybody at a thing together, that mass effect of consciousness. Uh, the, the tides that we see through lunacy at a full moon, et cetera. Mercury is going to indicate our siblings. If you've got a brother or a sister, whether or not they're a uh, twin or not, especially if they are, but either way, siblings are all mercurial. Cousins also fit the bill for being mercury-related, as do our uncles and our aunts. And then moving into more oh, uh, sneak preview there, I went back. Um, it also is going to be non-family people, such as um, co-workers, uh, merchants at stores, or waiters or waitresses, messengers, all of those casual acquaintance types. Venus. Venus is always an indicator of our lovers, that who we relate to, our partners, our love interests. Um, it's also going to stand out for aestheticians, which people that do hair, nails, makeup, anything related to beauty, anything related to partnership, marriages, things like that. Um, or especially social figures. It's about social times or people that we engage in a pleasant way uh, through a social situation. Mars is notorious for being sometimes about our enemies. Um, it's somebody that's going to kind of challenge us. It's a challenger, uh, which can come in through as a competitor, someone else who is in a similar category to ourselves, pushing us further, a comrade, someone who's on our team fighting for a similar cause, um, or any type of person that um, would, you know, consider themselves or be seen as a fighter, being in the police, military, firefighter, uh, gym trainer, anything that's got that kind of quality, that machismo is very Mars. Jupiter figures, those are our teachers, those are our guru types, the idea of like learning and expanding your mind, um, that all, that's, that's that type of quality. Um, it's all foreigners, anybody that's from a different area, that thinks in a different way, a different background, different religion. Um, Jupiter is also notorious for being about our benefactors, someone who's going to bring us a benefit, a boon. Um, and it's also the youth. Jupiter has a, um, a useful quality of, you know, young and exploring still. So there's all of those qualities flavor the people that express with Jupiterian qualities. Saturn quality people and figures, that's also the teacher. We see that we have that in both of those. And we can also see some teacher quality in Mercury. Um, the teacher from Saturn is more the disciplinarian, like, you know, hard, you know, make sure you do it the best, the right. You want to fine tune your process. You want to master the craft. Um, whereas Jupiter teaching is more about expanding and learning new frontiers. Saturn teaching is about doing something to its best degree. Um, and so it's also about authority figure, someone that is the boss in some way, the taskmaster, someone who does it the best already, the person that we look up to that does it with the most integrity, 
um, the most quality. It's our elders. It's anybody old, the older generation is Saturnian. Um, and it also speaks to the father. Saturn and the sun are both father-like qualities. Uh, one of them is kind of central and shining and outgoing. Um, the other one is just very serious and maybe more structured and disciplinarian. They both have that, that fathery figure um, archetype to them. Uranus is all about our groups. It's a collective, everybody, we type of energy. Um, I always say with, um, it comes out Uranus, Uranus so much, but it's, it's spelled a lot of places, O-U-R, um, A-N-O-U-S or whatever. Um, but it starts with O-U-R, our. It's about this collective our kind of quality. So Uranus, Uranus, all around us. Um, it's all of our groups. It's our friends, our network of people that we are with, we, our organizations. It's also radicals. Anybody that's different on the outside, um, unique. Um, it's also going to be electricians. It just files with things that are electric, new. It's entrepreneurial. It's like individualist. Um, it's techies. It's scientists. Um, anybody that is involved with, you know, inventing or, you know, engineering um, things that are scientific or technology related, for sure. Um, ETs, it's out there. It's into the future. It's futuristic. It's outer space. So, I mean, it is where we would file our ET friends. Um, and astrologers, those that study the sky, the, you know, Uranus was the sky god. Um, so all these sky space qualities out there, um, all of us, the collective, uh, collective umbrella of the sky, that's Uranus. Neptune, Neptune is going to be spiritual people, anybody that's involved with spiritualism. Um, and whether or not they are real or not, charlatans file with Neptune. So there are always going to be some that are, that are loving and all of these true qualities. And there's also going to be some of these that are uh, deceptive or contrarians or not what they seem. Um, but you will find the spiritual types coming through the symbol of Neptune, artists, all forms of imagination and artistry, special visual artistry, audio artistry. Um, Venus is going to be a little bit more when I think of like physical artistry, um, painting, things that are solid, sculpting, physical. She's got that sculpted beauty. Uh, Neptune is musical and poetical. Um, Neptune is um, is like film and liquid imagery, photography, all of those types of qualities. But you can see they share some qualities together. But musicians, actors, having multiple, per, you know, multiple personalities, playing multiple people, transcending their self for different roles. Um, this ethereal, shifty, elusive, all of these qualities are also going to talk about angels. It's just filing with the spiritual, um, but angelic quality, this really God source mystery of the universe quality is very Neptune. The charlatan is that is it's in that deceptive area. It's very hard to encapsulate the infinite in something that's finite. And so the ego and the personality is often mistaken or chasing the wrong carrot on the stick with Neptune uh, with rose colored glasses. So it's it's got that quality of, oh, no, disillusionment, disenchantment, deception, sabotage on um, things not being what they seem. That's that charlatan quality. Um, it's also caregiving. It's that compassionate thing we see through hospice and nursing and just all forms of caregiving and soothing. Um, we could also file people like um, hypnotists, anything, um, uh, working with that, working with um, energy healings, um, sound therapies. Um, it's also going to be the Navy. It's going to be anybody that works on the ocean. It is so oceanic. This, if we had to say which one of these is the most oceanic, probably Neptune. Moon's in there, but Neptune is extremely water related. Um, and it's also going to be the branch of chemistry. Chemistry, this is where the science of Uranus and the side of Aquarius kind of extends into. Um, the chemistry, which is an interesting, deceptive, unusual place of, um, you know, pharmaceuticals, um, poison, um, also elixirs, but it's that alchemy, all of that side of things is there. Pluto then, um, Pluto is going to dig us into anything related to the underground, a subculture, a hidden culture. Um, 
counterculture we're going to see with Uranus for sure. Um, but Pluto is more like the mob. Pluto is more like the the hidden dark market, dark web, black market, um, underground, shady, hidden, unconscious, destructive underbelly type underground um, in that way. It's all forms of waste res this res waste disposal and recycling. Uh, anything related to eliminating waste um, and recycling, and more and more so it should be come into recycling, that rebirthing, that transforming, but it is essentially all forms of getting rid of it, disposal as well. Um, spies, researching, investigating, um, the, all that spy type of quality um, is very Pluto, secretive, investigating, investors, business acumen. I think Shark Tank, think Pluto. Um, those that are investing, that use other people's money and resources to grow more, um, all of that, stock market, et cetera, cryptocurrency, whatever, investing is Pluto. Shamans, dealing with the underground and the dark, unconscious, hidden forces, occult forces, um, any of that. From the spiritual side, we are talking about the shamans, the occult forces in that hidden sense, past lives. Um, all of those type of inheritances, ancestries, Pluto shaman stuff. And it's also psychology. It is just your, you know, the mind, the motive, the, you know, how it's all designed. And that root word in psychologist psyche is actually a tune into soul. Um, and there's very much a lot in Pluto about the soul and our evolution from this dark place to this golden place as the soul evolves through necessity. Um, but Pluto is kind of like what, you know, it's it's all of those dark things and some of these bright things um, that kind of transform us in a profound way. Moving forward, let's see. So those tiers we got a glimpse of, I kind of mentioned already that everything from the sun through Mars, including the moon, Mercury, and Venus, those are our personal planets. Think about those as kind of like the planets have the most to say about how your personality shows up and interacts on a surface level. Um, it shows itself through interactions and thinking and speaking and uh, living together and being seen. All of that outer stuff is really established through those planets. Jupiter and Saturn then are considered social planets. It's kind of like the idea of like society growing and then kind of holding it down and like having a renaissance and a reformation and um, that kind of, you know, liberal and then conservative, those two spins of everything. Um, so they're considered the social planets because they have those tones of either enlarging and growing and more we're kind of like, you know, limiting, getting serious and all. So those flavors will tune in when they are in an aspect to some of those other personal planets. Um, and then other planets, um, Uranus, Neptune and Pluto are considered transpersonal. Um, which is very fitting, as we'll see in the next slide as well. But that means they they go beyond the personal level of ourself. They are in the same spot for so long. They represent larger generations of people and, and more collective tides of transformation. They create a personal effect um, to the degree that they happen in a person's personal chart from a personal house, um, especially if they're attached to a personal planet through an aspect. Um, but in a general sense, they are collective tones that are related to larger movements than just one person's personality. Um, and Uranus also happens to have the feature of acting as a higher octave of Mercury. So if Mercury is like our personal thinking and mind. It's like the collective supercomputer God mind. Then Neptune acting as a higher octave of Venus. If Venus is like our personal love nature, uh, Neptune is like our um, impersonal or... Um, unconditional, all-inclusive love nature. It's a, it's a higher love nature. And then if Mars is like our personal willpower and drive forward, Pluto is a higher octave of Mars, which expresses like a collective evolutionary willpower and drive forward um, from like the basement floor, if you will. So those are the different tiers of how the different planets are considered, which also relates to their speed. Um, and then we also can think about them having an elemental activity. And so the planets, you know, or some of them, you think about earth, air, fire, and water. Um, in a basic sense, the planets do have a general affinity to one of those. Um, the signs, when we look at that later, they definitely have elements. Um, but if we thought about elements with our planets, 
Uh, let's look at some justifications here that the sun is going to be fire. It's a huge fireball in the sky we can see. So it's fire um, in the sense of it also being light, being seen. It creates our daytime. So it's the light seeing aspect, the eye see um, aspect of fire and light in a centralization. It's like a the central core fireball. That's why it's got this heart. It's the central um, feature. The moon is super emotional. Emotional things are all have that watery kind of sense to them. So there's an emotional water element. But in that it molds, it's like this very close to our physical nature. It's one of the planets mostly associated with our physical nature molding it. It's got a little bit of an earth quality. It's got a little bit of the, the more solid, more personal, more separate, distinct um, so it's our water and our earth thing and like how it's like molding our little mud bodies um, through that, the the astral, um, the astral level that is molding all of those thought form impressions from higher is kind of what molds our emotion, you know, thinking molds the emotional astral, molds the physical. Um, and so the, the moon is like this little water cup vessel of our lower astral that holds and molds our personality and our individual expression. Mercury is, is going to be super associated with air, um, just, you know, you're hearing messages and zip zapping around and just the movement of air just constantly moving um, and the quality of direction, left, right, up, down, directionality and movement is all about the air, north, south, east, west, all of the air quality is very mercurial. Um, Venus, Venus could, uh, Venus kind of plays with all of the elements i think in a way um there's something that's very the earth goddess the material girl when we think about her with earth uh very kind of you know exciting our desire with fire um very kind of pleasing and symmetrical and all of these air balance equalities um and then um very what we love and the feeling of a very water equality so there's a little bit the venus will kind of go with anything um, it's about magnetism more than anything. I would say she's a magnetic element and it's a focus on attraction, um, attracting that, which is, you know, it's funny how both the paradox, birds of a feather flock together and opposites attract and Venus will do some of both. She loves that which is like her, that which is opposite and she loves it all. It's about what we attract and what we repel. Um, Mars, super much a fire element. It is a, it's the red planet. It's fire, it's anger, it's passion. So it's heat. It's the fire of heat, which when things heat up, it gets them going, it gets them moving. So Mars is the thrusting aspect of fire that blasts forward, that heats it into action. Whereas the sun is more of like holding a central light and shining and being seen. Jupiter, um, I said Jupiter is like steam if I had to pick something. Um, it's hot but it's also kind of diffuse. I might even say it's plasma. Um, it's this kind of like big web of, of warm, fiery, it's got, you know, it's got a warm feeling for sure to the Jupiter quality, um, but it's like gelatinous, it's moving out, it's stretching, it's it's all of that. So there's a liquidiness to it too, because it's, it's, it's enlarging. And so steam fits it very much, also especially through Pisces, but... Um, so that steam diffusion, it's expanding, it's growing. It's like it's like the blob, but like it, it's enlarging in a, in a good, warm feeling. Um, then Saturn is like a crystal. Saturn is very earth, very solid, very set, like a like a stone, like a precious metal and stone. It's earth, it's solid, it's contracted, it's it's hard, it's got boundaries, it's all of those qualities that make it very solid. Um your Uranus is totally electricity. It, it rules electricity. It's that sudden change, that spark, that light going on, that, you know, online, offline. Um, it's electric for sure. And then also I said tornado. It is an air sign. And Uranus actually really owns all natural disasters. Anything that is a natural disaster technically kind of follows suit with Uranus especially lightning strikes and that idea storm hurricane tornado uh, pops up all of a sudden destroys all the stuff is gone you know um in the mix neptune is so, oh and i guess oranus since it's electricity primarily it would be a fire hype it's fire related if i had to say earth air fire water 
Neptune, um, water, 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 water is the ocean. It is the big sea of everything. It is water. Um, and so it would also elementally align itself with that of a flood, uh, everything being flooded. Um, it also is considered with the moon. The moon is like our personal astral space and level and environment, our personal astral plane, if you will. Um, Neptune is the whole astral plane. It is um, everything and it is, it's it's the the less personal sense. It's the transpersonal, all, all inclusive level of astral, emotional, karmic energy. It's very wet um, with that watery sense along with the moon. So out of the, you know, those watery astral ones, Neptune is a big one and it dissolves boundaries. It melts everything into one key word for Neptune, atonement, at one minute. It puts everything together and it forgives. It's this merciful kind of, you know, ending of suffering and, and all of these qualities esoterically combined. Pluto, um, Pluto, I said fire. Um, it does have a water too. And when we think about it in Scorpio, it's like boiling water. It is, there is a karmic astral component to Pluto, Scorpio stuff that's watery astral. Uh, but it does have that fiery, it's like what would boil the water, excited into action, get it, 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 it's like a crucible. It fires things up so that the um, the gold rises to the top and all of the excrement is boiled out. Um, so it's that type of fire that also somehow it magnetizes impurities to burn them up, to destroy them. So it, it, it really is like a moth to a flame. It brings in that which needs to be transformed, that which is no longer essential, no longer serving. It, it brings it to a head and then inflames it. And like, like a volcano, uh, erases everything and rebirths new fertilized something it's in that evolution, but kind of fiery in that respect. Um, and after that, we're ready to look at the essential yin yang or masculine and feminine association. So all of those things considered, if we were to slap the gender labels on these planets, what do they look like? And a little caveat that um, anything can mix and match any which way. Um, and when we look at the signs, I'll also explain how all the signs are um, by, in a sense, it makes the planets by, with the exception of two, our classic two, uh, sun and moon. I think it would be hard pressed to find a lot about a feminine nature to the sun and a masculine nature to the noon, because most places, the sun is unequivocally considered a yang or masculine outer shining force daytime. And the moon is overwhelmingly considered a yin, passive feminine nighttime force, reflecting the light of the sun. So there is a masculine and a feminine uh, dichotomy with the sun and the moon that is pretty much as old as time in most cultures, traditions, religions, and, and things. So there's that, that solar and lunar quality, these two big balls in the sky, one in the daytime, one in the nighttime one being yang mask, one being in feminine. So that is kind of like the baseline of a polarity. Uh, when we go into Mercury, the messenger or the mind of the sun, the solar emissary, if you will, um, Mercury has a tendency to be thought of throughout as being androgynous. Uh, Mercury Hermes is a guy. And since it's about air, a masculine and sign element, and it's movement and the movement quality is yang, Perhaps we would say Mercury is maybe a little bit more mask, um, but it's very useful masculinity. It is very close to femininity. In fact, when you merge Mercury or Hermes with uh, Venus, Aphrodite, that is where you get the word hermaphrodite, which is Hermes Aphrodite, um, which is the idea of this very feminine and a uh, thing that's about the both and the androgynous kind of blending. And you get like, the idea of bearded Aphrodite and this, you know, both. But that's a very mercurial, mercurial thing of splitting and going both ways. Um, so Mercury, more than most planets, has got a reign on androgyny um, and just the idea of a duality, uh, splitting things into. Uh, Venus and Mars is another combo that is kind of culturally, socially accepted where Venus is a yin feminine female symbol and Mars is a yang masculine symbol. Um, 
in signs, you know, there's there's a sign where feminine uh, feminine Venus is in a masculine sign, and masculine Mars is in a feminine sign. So they they both have other places they can rule and demonstrate themselves. But just of itself, Venus is going to tune us into our Yin feminine nature, and Mars is going to speak about our Yang masculine nature, how we are receptive and how we are projective, how we push forward, how we penetrate, how we do all the little things the Mars symbol is for. And then the feminine symbol, the feminine is the receptivity. It is the softness. It is the um, all of those qualities that just compute as that dimension. Um, so they're the next most clear cut for a yin-yang mask-feminine combo along with the sun and the moon. How fitting with little Mercury going both ways and balancing in between those. And that completes our personal planets. And it's really only in the personal planets that that gender distinction, in a traditional sense at least, stays intact. As we move further, the lines begin to blur. Um, with Jupiter and Saturn, I say they are both, both. Um, they're social. They're not particularly one or the other. Um, there's a sense in which we could say they're both male in the sense that Jupiter, Zeus, and Kronos, Saturn, you know, male mythological figures. Um, but then there's some paradox in here, too. Is the way that Jupiter is so soft um, gives it some claim on that feminine dimension. And Saturn being so hard gives it a lot of claim in the masculine dimension. Um, so they both express a little bit of both. Um, overall, though, Jupiter's brand of both um, is considered yang in the sense of it's expanding, it's moving out. And that's why in the Kabbalistic Tree of Life, it is on um, that masculine pillar of outward expression, of, it, of it's moving out. So there's a yang quality associated with Jupiter, um, which is masculine. But it's like a soft yes. It's a soft allowance. And so that yes, yes on factor of outgoing, reaching out, moving out, all has a masculine undertone. Um, then when we look at Saturn, Saturn is very still. In general, active passive is yang yin for those two positions. And so it's still as Saturn is it's very slow movement um it's stillness it's set solidarity is very yin and feminine um but it is a sense of kind of like a tough hard no type of feminine it's like it's like a boundary um and it's like the limit of of the material world really um but it's it's like the it's like mom saying no whereas Jupiter's like dad saying yeah um, and so there's there's a little paradox there as to how they can both present as what we could find qualities of each gender with, um, but there is there's a quality that puts them puts them in that way. We'll just leave it there. Um, they've got a little bit of each, but they're I feel most comfortable in the Jupiter is a soft yes, and Saturn is a hard no, um, and those can have both masculine and feminine qualities to them. Um, when we get into the next two, Uranus and Neptune, they really have a way in which, you know, being representative of Aquarius and Pisces, they are yang and yin. Um, being as electric and sudden and exciting as Uranus is, um, it's, it's, there's nothing yin about it. It is very electric, outgoing, shocking, energizing, all of those qualities. The same way that Neptune is very yin and, a, and like kind of a still, the ocean just all melting and blurring together over a span of timelessness. It's very sitting. It's kind of drifting. All of that that's very yin. Um, so we would start with that consideration. But as yang as Uranus is, and that's got a masculine to it, it's really about things being queer. And when I say queer, I mean odd, weird, unusual. Um, gay, sure, yeah, whatever, but it's all forms of queer, weird, um, radical, um, av you know, avant-garde, all of those types of qualities, um, mutant, mutation, um, all of those futuristic or, you know, sci-fi, 
Uranus is about that level of radical and bizarre. So that's why it's going to cast as queer. Um, Neptune, Neptune is blurring everything so much that it really, I mean, sure, it, it's it's transpersonal and it's going to go back and forth over whatever lines you draw. So very trans, um, but also even beyond that, you could throw the trans word in uh, Uranus also because it's, it's going to be in that queer category. But um, Neptune is, is going to go more toward things that are even, it spiritualizes, which makes things platonic, which makes things asexual. There's a fantasy quality, usually with something like Pluto exciting it. But overall, this is, it's a beyond male and female. And so it's asexual, it's no sexual, it's both sexual um, in that Neptunian sense. Pluto, um, Pluto, I say, is both. Um, it has, there is a slow um, kind of, just kind of sitting, boiling quality that is, in a sense, yin, but it is always pushing, goading, churning, uh, which is a little bit uh, yang. Um, but it is, it's almost like the slow stall of evolution over time that slowly churns with necessity forward. Um, and so that's kind of why I put that with tagline here. It's the karmic obsession towards ultimate necessity for evolution. Um, and so it's it kind of does whatever is needed. It will sit and wait or it will push um, towards whatever needs to happen. Is it just a sitting and a waiting for everything to decay or, you know, become the next thing? Or is it something where it inflames into it? But both that idea of inflammation, of like bursting into flames, volcanic style, um, or decaying over time. I'm going to say some decay with Saturn too, but both of those can file with um, that Pluto churn. So I believe that is the end of the considerations for our planets now. Um, I hope that everybody has gotten some unique perspective and seen a different or unique uh, thing or two from everything I've put forward. And I hope that when I go into the signs, some of this can kind of be thought about at the same time. And then again, on the 30th, I will be holding a gathering both online and in person for those that are local here in North Carolina, um, that we will discuss some of these yin and yang natures to the planets and signs in more individual uh, consideration. So uh, feel free to leave a comment, uh, visit my website, find me on social media, and we'll keep on rocking out with the stars. Uh, thanks, everybody, for showing up. Y'all have a great day.